Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our special presentation. On screen in front of you are some of the coming events from Black History Walks. This event is brought to you via Black History Walks and the UCL Sarah Parker Ramon Center. The music you were listening to was the music of the Chevalier de Saint George. For this session, we're going to take Q&A in the middle and at the end. So we'll use the chat function on your Zoom. And if you have a question, you can actually type the question to the chat function and we'll answer questions at the, in the middle of the presentation at the very end of the presentation. This session has been recorded. So if you have a friend who can't get in for some reason, they'll be sent a recording in about 40 hours. This is a bit about the Sarah Parker Ramon Center at UCL. As you can see there, they study the impact of racism, scientific, metaphysical, metaphysical and cultural, and they can be found not far from Gower Street and Good Street area. They have a lot of really inter interesting um, podcasts, and this is just a sample of some of the um, previous episodes they've done. Black History Watch has been organizing Walks, talks, and films on learners' black history since 2007. And every single month of the year, there's something happening either a guided history walk or a talk or a film. We'll mention more about the walks later on, but this is just a sample of some of the 12 walks you have in different parts of the capital, which take place roughly all year long in different parts of the capital. So for today's session, um, we're going to hear about British slave owners tracking the money and the stories of the enslaved. First, we're going to hear from Professor Matthew Smith, director at LBS, and then we're going to hear from Rachel Lang as a researcher at LBS, and then you hear from me, Tony Warner, from Black History Walks. And all of this history will be quite interesting, if not fascinating, and we'll link into the capital, as well as the Caribbean, as well as Africa. So the next voice you're going to hear is the voice of Professor Matthew Smith. Thank you, Tony. Good evening, everyone. Evening for those of us who are in the UK, afternoon, morning, and other hours of the day for everyone else who's tuning in. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I know we have a, a very large international audience with us today, and we're very pleased that you're, you're here with us. I want to start by first offering my thanks on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery to the Sarah Parker Riemann Center for their work in uh, making this event possible, and also especially to Tony Warner and Black History Walks. It's been a pleasure really working with Tony on putting together today's event. And I hope you will find it very interesting as well as informative as all of the events that have been put on by Tony and Black History Walks. So we're very grateful for them for inviting us and for also working so closely with us on making this evening happen. And I thank you, everybody who's tuned in especially for being here with us. It's a Saturday in most parts of the world it is, and you have taken the time to be with us to learn some history from us and to also exchange uh, your own stories, your own interests with us. And we don't take that for granted. We're very grateful to have you here with us. I want to start by briefly introducing the work of the Center. The Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery has been around for almost a dozen years. It grew out of a project that many people might be familiar with, the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, which was very instrumental in exposing, if you will, or really documenting the history of the compensation money that was paid to British slave owners at the end of formal emancipation in 1838. That's been the very foundation of the work we have done. But it's not the only work we have done. We have used that premise to expand on these questions about what was British slavery and what was its impact commercially as well as morally, as well as socially on the British empire and the development of modern Britain. 
The centerpiece of a lot of that work is the database that we have, the LBS database. And I think we will put this in the chat for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, which will give you a link to the database. Currently, we have over 60,000 names on that database. And the foundation of a lot of that material, the evidence for it, was drawn from the compensation records that were housed at the, um, that are housed really in original form at the, um, the National Archives of the UK. We're able to use that material, put it in, create these networks that show not only individual slave owners, but we would expand from that in a separate phase of the project, which looked at estates, estates in various parts of the Caribbean, who owned the estates, their location, tying it into the compensation records to give a more fulsome picture of what the economy of what we often refer to as a slavery business looked like, and importantly, how that economy was fundamental in uh, creating the sort of springboard for the development of modern Britain in the middle of the 19th century and forward. So that is what we do. It's not all we do, but it's the crux of what we do. And if I was to sum it up in a sentence, it would be to use public records and public archival data and make that freely accessible to the public. All of the information that we have used, all of the information that was meant, that was put together for uh, the records that we have and for the activities we do is available on our database. The next big question then is how we do it. And we do it by looking at the records, the extant records, what we can find about these stories. And a lot of that is dependent, not just on the work that our researchers have done in the archives and creating this database that is made accessible to everyone internationally. And right now I should add that we've had over 2 million visitors, many researchers and students, uh, as well as members of the general public, people interested in their genealogical histories using the database. So that's a fundamental part of it, but it's not the only part because we do rely very significantly and have relied on the work of our associates, members of the public who see the work we do, who uh, value the work we do, and who uh, contribute to that work by enhancing and giving us new uh, information that allows us to flesh out the stories that you find on the database. And then the final aspect that I want to touch on in this introduction is why we do this work what it is that motivates the work that we have been doing in the center for a dozen years. And we hope we will expand into uh, even more time. And the fundamental reason comes back to something that the founders of the center, my predecessors, director, Professor Nick Draper, Professor Catherine Hall and Keith McClelland had as their guiding principle, which was to reinscribe the story of slavery into British history reinscribe the story of slavery into British history, which means that there had been this sort of historical amnesia in British history regarding slavery. And by using the records that, that were used, the compensation records, the estate records, and all associated extant records that we have, again, many uh, of the uh, threads being supplied by people who are uh, associates and uh, co-collaborators in many ways of our project, we've been able to do that. The discourse around the question of slavery and what it cost and what it meant to the British Empire has uh, become even more acute uh, since the work of, this, of, of the center and particularly in the past year. But that's not the only reason why we do it. And a central reason why we do it, and it's one that I, I take very seriously as director as we expand, is to also reintroduce and reinscribe the story of the Caribbean into British history. Because the story of the Caribbean was not just fundamental as a place where commerce was made, where riches and wealth were derived and the profits of which would be reinvested in other endeavors here uh, in the metropole in Great Britain. But it's a place where people lived, where people exchanged, where people died through the system of slavery, a very brutal and harsh system, and a place that was very much shaped by these larger tentacles of empire and slavery. And those questions, those histories that were shaped, which, we are, which are carried on today by the individuals, the Caribbean people living in Britain today and the Caribbean people living in the Caribbean is part of British history. Generation before my generation, a generation just within the lifetime of many of us out there 
uh, on this on this uh, on this event this evening consider themselves British subjects before they consider themselves nationals of Caribbean territories. That's a significant point. And the, much of that story, much of the entanglements behind that story are bound up in this larger, longer and knotted history of British slavery. So that is one of the key principles that we, that we intend uh, to do. One of the things that we uh, rely very much on a public, both in Britain as well as internationally, and especially in the Caribbean, to assist us with, which is why we're very glad that you are here with us to exchange with us, to hear this, uh, a summary of the work we do, and to see how in action we can put these stories together to create a new way of understanding the important history and meaning of British slavery. I'm now going to transition to my colleague, Rachel Lang, a researcher and administrator with the center. And Rachel is going to demonstrate for us how that material that I've described can be applied in sketching out stories of uh, people who were entangled uh, in this longer history of slavery. She's going to take us through three families and then we'll have some time afterwards to discuss this with you. Rachel. Thanks, Matt. I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. Okay. So my first case study is the Whitemans of Grenada. And I just want to point out Grenada to you um, and check that you can see my cursor moving on the screen here. So here, here we are. This is our bearings in the Caribbean. And um, I'll speak about the Whitemans for about 20 minutes. And I'll use this example to illustrate the ways in which the slave registers can reveal more about the lives of enslaved people. The Whitemans were affected by manumission, so in that way they weren't typical. But the slave registers in general can reflect uh, a web of connections, particularly when they're combined with other sources. Um, by manumission, I mean someone who's, um, some members of the Whiteman family were freed from slavery. My second case study is the Greens of St Kitts, and this is a very different family. And it's also about a 20 minute presentation. This is the family of the company Green King that apologised for their involvement in historical slavery last June. So my, the question I have in the second case study is, what were their links to Caribbean slavery and what were they apologizing for? And then briefly, I'd like to talk about the Beckfords of Jamaica, primarily about memorialization. And then I'll pass back to Matt. So, my interest in the Whitemans began when I found a will by an Andrew Whiteman. And he wrote his will in um, 1811. So you can see here, it says, this is a copy of the, the beginning of it. I, Andrew Whiteman, are at present residing in Willow Walk, Kentish Town, in the county of Middlesex, but generally residing in the island of Grenada in the West Indies, where I intend shortly to return. Andrew Whiteman owned Upper Latant, which was a sugar estate in Grenada. And he had some other smaller properties as well, another smaller estate in Cariacou. He married Martha Smith in London in 1791, and he appears to have moved regularly between Grenada and London. At least one of the children was born in London about 1798. And as we saw, he wrote his will in London in 1811, where he described himself as at present residing in Willow Walk, Kentish Town. So I had a look for Willow Walk and it's since been renamed Fortress Walk and it's behind the, um, the fire station. The fire station is just here, just off the Highgate Road. So you can see it doesn't look now like it would have looked at the time, but just around the corner is an, um, is, um, an early 19th century terrace, which is probably um, um, what the buildings that Andrew Whiteman was living in on Willow Walk would have looked like. But this is an early photograph because now there are big shop fronts um, covering up the terrace, basically. And here is a map of Grenada from 1780. And um, this is Upper Latant here in the parish of St. David. And here's a close up of the parish of St. David and the 
boundaries of Upper Latanta here. In his will, Andrew Whiteman mentions four children with his wife, Martha Smith. Um, this is quite a complicated family tree because he has eight children by four different women. So I'm gonna explain it in a bit more detail. So here is Andrew Whiteman and here is his wife, Martha Smith. And he had four children with her, William, James, John and Eliza. Also mentioned in the will are four natural or illegitimate daughters. Judith and Catherine, whose mother was Rose Magalas. He describes Rose, Rose Magalas as a free woman of colour. So um, I think she's the daughter of Maita Magalas, who is Andrew Whiteman's white um, business partner. So there's Judith and Catherine. And then he had a third daughter, Clarissa, with Madeleine Itt. Madeleine Itt, it was an enslaved woman on Upper Estate, on Upper Latant. So she was, so she was owned as an enslaved woman by Andrew Whiteman. So there is Clarissa here. And then he mentions a fourth daughter, Jane Ann. And Jane Ann's mother was Laurencine. And Laurencine was also an enslaved woman on Upper Latant. So the main people that I'm going to be talking about, as well as Andrew Whiteman, are his um, legitimate sons, especially William, the eldest, and also Clarissa, the daughter of an enslaved woman, Madeleine Itt, and also Jane Ann, the daughter of Laurency. Clarissa and Jane Ann were born into slavery because their mothers were enslaved, but Andrew Whiteman paid £100 each for the manumission of Clarissa and Jane Ann in 1806 when they were still children. I want to explore the contrasting lives of Whiteman's children to give examples of how in some cases the slave registers can be used to shed light on the lives of specific enslaved people. So I'm gonna very briefly run through the fortunes of the Whiteman sons. Here's the eldest son, William. He inherited Upper Latant. He managed the estate until his death, probably in the early 1850s. I'll have more about what happened to the estate after emancipation later. The second son, James Henry, here he is. Um, was registered as a merchant in Bengal in India in 1818. But his advancement in India was still tied to the family's West India networks. The surety for his bond as a free merchant in Bengal was provided by McKinlock, McKinlock and Palmer of King's Arms Yard in London. They were the London business partners of his father, Andrew and brother William in Grenada. James's career was cut short by his early death in Batavia, which is modern day Jakarta and Indonesia in the mid 1820s. The third and youngest son, John, is the only one I have a portrait of. He married Sarah Horsley in Essex in 1823. With his older brother taking care of the Grenadian property and also a solid and an, and an expensive education behind him, John was in need of new opportunities for himself and he found these working as a merchant in the East India Company. Again, like his brother James, using his father's Grenadian business partners, the Palmers, for sureties. John was a merchant in Bengal in 1828. His daughters, Sarah and Elizabeth, were born in Macau, which is um, just across the water from Hong Kong in China in the early 1830s. I don't have more details about his early career, but it's clear that by the late 1830s, he'd built up sufficient capital and connections to be able to live as an East India merchant permanently in Britain. So he's an absentee as well, in a way, but from, um, from India rather than from the Caribbean. He was obviously a successful businessman. He was living at Bryanston Square in London in the census of 1851, with a housekeeper, three ladies' maids, a housemaid, a kitchen maid, a scullery maid, a lady in attendance, a butler, a footman and a groom. He'd also risen to the position of director of the East India Company and he'd taken on respectable, powerful roles in society. He was a local magistrate and he was a justice of the peace in London and deputy lieutenant for the county of Essex where he also bought a fancy country estate. He died in Essex in 1866, leaving a personal estate of £90,000. And here's Bryanston Square, um, where he was living in splendour with all his servants. The eldest son, William, remained in Grenada. 
And this is the 1817 slave register entry for Upper Latant. This is the beginning of a list of 131 enslaved people. Um, and you can see it starts, this is quite a typical slave register. It starts a list of slaves belonging to or in the lawful possession of William Henry Whiteman as attorney for William and Horsley Palmer um, trustees because his father's estate is still going through probate and worked upon Upper Latant estate in the parish of St. David. So in, as in the, um, the usual pattern of, of um, slave registers, you have the names of enslaved people, the names that um, slave owners recorded and may not be the names that they called themselves. Color, which was a complex um, racist classification system. Country, which means Creole um, or African, um, Creole meaning born into slavery in the colonies and African meaning trafficked across the Atlantic. Supposed age we have here, and then marks, or sometimes it's called remarks, which may give the name of um, the mother, or it may, um, it may give some other kinds of personal details. For example, here, this is Jean Charles, and he's black, he's African, he's age 42, and it says under marks, a mark on his belly where he cut it open. But most of them for remarks, it says none. And um, in some slave register entries, um, there will just be no remarks um, added at all. This is the beginning of, of, so this is the first 23 of the 131 enslaved people that um, William Whiteman owns on Upper Latant. The next entry in 1817 made by William Whiteman is quite different. If you see here, it says a list of slaves belonging to or in the lawful possession of William Henry Whiteman as guardian of Jane Ann Whiteman. Jane Ann Whiteman is the youngest of Andrew's illegitimate daughters and she's not yet 21. I think she's not yet 18 years old. So she has a guardian of her property who is her half brother, William. And you can see here that Jane Ann Whiteman in the parish of St. David owns Gilbert Black and Creole aged one, and Laurencine, Black and Creole aged 27. And if you remember from the um, family tree that I showed earlier, Laurencine is Jane Ann's mother because um, Andrew Whiteman bequeathed to Jane Ann in his will 300 pounds and the ownership of Laurencine. And um, Andrew Whiteman's um, rationale that he described in his will for, for doing this was to assist in taking care of her and for their mutual support. You can also see that um, as well as Laurencine, Laurencine has had a child, Gilbert, and Gilbert is given as black, which means that he will have had black father and he's one year old. So Jane Ann now, as well as owning her mother, she owns her half brother. Gilbert was baptized in um, St. David on the same day as William Whiteman's illegitimate child, Andrewina. In 1822, Jane Ann made the slave registration herself, so she'd come of age. Um, this is the 1825 register, which was made, which says a list of slaves belonging to Jane Ann Whiteman in the town of St. George by her agent, Clarissa Whiteman. Clarissa is another of the illegitimate daughters of Andrew Whiteman. And Clarissa is acting as agent of Jane Ann, which suggests that Jane Ann isn't on the island at the time. And you can see here is Laurencine again, aged 35 years. And here is Gilbert, who's now nine. And Laurencine has had three more boys, Jean-Baptiste aged seven, age seven, Alison aged five, and Edmund aged 18 and a half months. And Edmund dies soon after this. As well um, as having an agent, um, you can see that the registration is not made in um, the parish of St. David. It's in the town of St. George. So now that, um, now that Jane Ann doesn't need to rely on the owner of Upper Latant, it suggests that um, Laurencine has moved to the main town in the area, area and is probably working independently to support herself.
Um, I had some difficulties finding early images of St George, but this is a portrait of the harbour uh, with the town of St George here where Laurentine was living. This is from 1851. This is the 1831 slave register. You can see that um, Laurentine here, aged 41 now, has been manumitted. So she's been um, freed from slavery by Jane Ann. And Jane Ann has also manumitted the eldest boy, Gilbert. And what's really unusual about this slave registry registration is that the agent who's registering on behalf of Jane Ann is Laurencine. So you can see here that Laurencine is registering her own manumission. And um, she's signed by Mark here, which means that she um, can't um, sign her own name. Laurencine acts as her daughter's agent again in 1833. So you can see belonging to Jane Ann Whiteman in the possession of Laurencine Whiteman as her agent. And here are the two youngest boys because Edmund, who was a baby in the first register that we saw, well, the 1822 register has, has died. So now Jane Ann just owns um, her two remaining half brothers. At some point in the first half of 1834, Laurencine took on ownership of the two remaining boys for herself. It's not clear if she was gifted the boys by Jane Ann or if um, she'd saved money and purchased them. But here you can see a list of slaves belonging to Laurencine Whiteman in the town of St George, 31st of July, 1834, Jean-Baptiste and Alison. And here again is Laurencine signing by Mark. Laurencine was awarded 41 pounds, five shillings and eight pence compensation for the ownership of her two sons in 1834. The example of Laurencine and Jane Ann and the ownership of family members illustrate that there are many different ways of being unfree and a hugely varied experience in the conditions under which enslaved people lived. Clarissa, Jane Ann and Laurencine are not the only examples to be found in the slave registers of people owning family members. In some cases, it's a, it's a subversion of slave ownership. It's owning to protect rather than to exploit. And sometimes when you can see people purchasing family members and not manumitting them, it seems to be because it's cheap because they can't afford to manumit as well. So they can just afford to purchase. It's also, it also shows the importance of building networks in ensuring your basic survival. So you're gaining support and connecting with the people that you care about and you're only as strong as your connections are strong. Laurencine may be considered to be one of the fortunate ones. Her ownership by J Man presumably enabled her to escape the harsh, harsh physical labor endured by most enslaved women on sugar estates. However, she was very young, probably aged about 11 or 12 when Jane Ann was born, and the few surviving records of Andrew Whiteman reveal him to be a particularly controlling man. Not all the enslaved women, all girls who took his attention, fared, who caught his attention fared so well. He wrote in his will in 1811, in consequence of the late base and shameful conduct of my mulatto woman slave named Anne, who I once intended to manumit and make free, I do hereby request and direct that the said woman named Anne, together with her children, may be sold and disposed of for the benefit of my estate. Andrew Whiteman's connections with Anne are unknown, but his intention to manumit her shows that she must have been important to him. She may have been another of his daughters or her children may have been his own. So what happened to Upper Latant? Upper Latant is a small settlement today. I found it on Google Maps here. And this is the Latant Road. And you can see there's just a small row of houses, which I think pretty sure is Upper Latant. Um, William Henry Whiteman, Andrew's eldest son, wrote his will in Grenada in 1838. There are some signs of financial difficulties for William. Um, he mentions in his will a debt of over 3,000 pounds owed to his mother. 
William bequeathed Upper Latant to his four illegitimate children. Their mother was Elizabeth Taylor deceased and um, Elizabeth is described by William as a free musty woman. By musty, he means she's 15 sixteenths. So 15 sixteenths of European heritage and one sixteenth of African heritage. And note that although Elizabeth Taylor's children were favored, William still didn't marry her. And even in 1838, he felt he needed to describe Elizabeth Taylor in racial terms. William left a further 500 pounds in trust for the three children of Antoinette, described by William as a mulatto woman attached and belonging to Upper Latant. He left 400 pounds to another illegitimate daughter, Andrewina. She's the girl who was baptized in St. David on the same day as Laurencine's eldest boy, Gilbert. He described Andrewina as the daughter of Charlotte, now deceased a black woman, lately attached and belonging to Upper Latant. It's not clear to what extent William's children were able to profit from their ownership of the estate. In, this is an advertisement for the sale of Upper Latant, and you can see that the, um, the auction is going to take place in Token House Yard at Lothbury in London. And the sale is organised over here, but in the court of the commissioners for the sale of encumbered estates in the West Indies. So this suggests that the estate has accrued unsupportable debts. William's fathering of many children with enslaved women on his estate echoes the behaviour of his father, Andrew. But the outcome with his outside family as the favoured children in the will is, is different. One similarity between Andrew and William's wills is at, um, Andrew's callous taunting and punishment of the enslaved woman Anne and his description of Anne's base and shameful conduct. William wrote a, wrote his, he wrote his will in 1838, William did, but six years later he wrote a codicil, an amendment to his will. And in that he wrote, and whereas the conduct of my daughter Andrewina, commonly called Annie, towards me has of late been so very shameful, overbearing and disgraceful, beastly and disgusting, I do hereby utterly revoke, disallow and disannul all bequests and legacies made by me in the said will to the said Andrewina. I haven't traced Andrewina, but I think I may have found Anne. In 1820, in the slave registers, um, William Whiteman manumits an enslaved woman on Upper Latant called Anne, and she's the only, and um, and she's listed as mulatto, which is um, the way that Andrew Whiteman described her in his will as well. She's the only person in the slave register for Upper Latant, only woman who's described as mulatto and with her name Anne as well. It's not conclusive proof, but it does suggest that maybe Andrew Whiteman's wishes for Anne may not have been carried out. Some points to note about the Whitemans. The free and unfree divide was not necessarily a simple one. And it's easy to think about slave owning families on the one hand and enslaved families on the other, but there was not always such a simple separation. And Issues of slavery and freedom and even love can hinge in slave society on the social intricacies of race. With James and John Whiteman, they're the two younger sons. If we go right back, um, the two younger sons of Andrew Whiteman, you see a transfer of capital from the West Indies to the East Indies. And this is important because um, it's it's not only about um, Andrew Whiteman leaving his sons a lot of money. It's not just about moving money around the globe. It's about the transfer of other kinds of capital, um, educational capital that um, Andrew Whiteman spent a lot of money on, but also um, social capital and connections, which are invaluable, and also expectations. What these sons believed was expected of them or they deserved or, or should happen to them in terms of success in their lives. And finally, the slave registers document oppression and dehumanization 
but they can also provide glimpses into enslaved society. I don't have any images of Laurencine or Jane Ann. Um, as I found in the next presentation about, um, about the Green family, images of rich white men are very easy to find, but um, portraits of enslaved people, particularly named enslaved people in the Caribbean, are very difficult to find. And many of the 18th and century, 18th and 19th century drawings that we're familiar with, like um, you know, cutting the cane holes or the courthouse in Antigua, the, the most um, famous um, uh, um, drawings from the 1830s, um, these drawings are romanticized. They're drawn by artists looking to sell paintings to rich white men. And therefore, particularly, I want to draw your attention to a wonderful archive that's held in the, it's held by the National Library of Congress in Washington, DC, and part of the archive is available online. It's William Berryman's sketchbook. And these are um, pictures, are uh, drawings from Jamaica. So William Berryman was an English artist who lived in Jamaica between 1808 and 1815. Berryman intended to use his drawings as the basis for a series of lithographs, but he died before completing the project. So the drawings that survive are his sketches of real people and not the finished articles that he'd intended to sell to a white audience. You can see in this picture, these, these women are Miss, Mr. Bryan's washerwomen on Dry River Estate in Jamaica. As well as landscapes, Berryman drew enslaved people going about everyday tasks. The subjects of his drawings are generally preoccupied and they're facing away from him, but they have an immediacy that is unusual in portraits of enslaved people in the Caribbean at this time. 86 of Berryman's 300 sketches are available on the National Library and the in the Library of Congress website. And if you Google, um, this, this lady is um, uh, beating cassava. And um, if you Google, um, William Berryman, Library of Congress, that will take you to the collection. So this is my case study and uh, a set of different stories to the Whitemans. This is the Greens of St Kitts. Last summer, in the wake of Black Lives Matter protests, a number of British firms faced a public reckoning over their connections to Caribbean slavery. Perhaps the two most reported in the media were Lloyd's and Green King. One of Green King's publicised attempts at reparations has been a partnership and investment in the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool. So this is Green King's, this is part of their public statement of apology and also a statement by Richard Benjamin, who's the head of the International Slavery Museum. So the chief executive of Green King says, um, it is inexcusable that one of our founders profited from slavery and while that was nearly, six, nearly 200 years ago, we can't pretend it didn't happen. We want to educate and work with the International Slavery Museum to learn more about the past and better inform our choices for the future. And here is a statement from Richard Benjamin, the head of the International Slavery Museum. So he says, reparative justice must acknowledge past abuses and respond to their continuing legacies. We hope that more institutions and businesses in the UK with the same historical links to slavery can be equally as transparent about their origins. So who is, what is Green King? Green King is Britain's largest pub owner and brewer. They run over 3,100 pubs, restaurants and hotels. Their net income in 2018, so that's before lockdown, was 162.5 million in pounds in that year. It's likely that most of us have contributed to their profits. I definitely have. And their history is relevant to all of us. So what were their slavery connections and what exactly were they apologizing for? This is Benjamin Green, the founder of the dynasty. He was born in 1780. He was the 13th and youngest child of Benjamin Green, who was a draper. He didn't join the family firm. Instead, he was apprenticed to a brewer in London in his teens. By his early 20s, he was ready to set up in business for himself. 
he formed a partnership with William Buck at Westgate Brewery in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk in 1806. Bury St Edmunds is still the headquarters of the Green King business. And here is the Westgate Brewery on Crown Street in Bury St Edmunds in 1839. Green's neighbour in Crown Street was Sir Patrick Blake, who was the owner of, St, of estates in St Kitts and Montserrat. Blake's wife was also a West Indian heiress. The Blakes faced financial difficulties and piling debts. As a result, they rented out their country pile and they moved into town, um, and therefore they became neighbours of, of the Greens. The Blakes had no children of their own, in contrast to the large Green family who became their close friends. The Blakes were known for their generosity, but also for their lack of financial acumen. Under Blake's marriage settlement of 1792, his wife was due an annuity of £1,500 a year secured on the West India estates. So when Blake died, his wife was due a huge amount of money every year secured on estates that were already in financial trouble. Green became a trustee of the marriage settlement in 1817, and he took over the absentee management of the St Kitts estates. Blake died in 1818, and when his wife died five years later, she left Green a half share in her own St Kitts and Montserrat property. So Benjamin Green became a West India proprietor, partly through luck, chance and friendship, but also because of his business savvy. He had a willingness to take on financial management responsibilities on behalf of his friends and also a willingness to capitalise on these connections for himself. The slave registers for St Kitts show that Benjamin Green took ownership of 165 enslaved people on Phillips or Phipps estate in St Kitts on the 6th of December 1825. Um, Lady Blake's maiden name was Phipps. Green never visited the Caribbean. Accounts for his management of the estate have not survived. It's difficult to know how real his human property seemed to him. Here is the first page of the slave register for Phipps estate in 1828. So here, for example, we have Archer, male, black, age 26, and a country rather than Africa, and it says Mandingo of Africa. So he's from Ivory Coast or oh, Southern Mali sort of area. And um, under usual employment, which is cut off a bit here, it said it says field holding. So he's digging um, holes in the fields for the for the sugar cane. So here are the first 11 of the 165 people that he owns. And here is the second to last page from the slave registers. And you can see this is Judy Warner, female, black, aged four, Creole of St. Kitts. And uh, under her employment, it says, this is cut off on the slide, but it says, infant does nothing. So anyone age six or under, or maybe seven or, or under, is described as infant does nothing. And over that age, they work, the children are working full time in the fields. One thing that's clear about Benjamin Green is that he held, even for the time he held, trenchant views on slavery. In June 1828, he bought the local newspaper, the Bury and Suffolk Herald in, in Suffolk, where his brewery was. The tone was high Tory, anti-reform, anti-Catholic emancipation, and it also coincided in the late 1820s with the growth of local abolitionist movements in, the Carib in Britain and the Caribbean. Green laid into the growing anti-slavery movement with his teeth, beginning with a series of letters to the newspaper in early February 1828. His decision to buy the newspaper five months later may have been related to the obvious enjoyment he gained from presenting pro-slavery arguments. On March the 17th, he wrote that, the persons of the Negroes are protected by the most equitable laws, and moreover, without fear of confutation, that they are better clothed, better housed, and better fed than the English agricultural labourer. In 1830, Benjamin Green published a pamphlet entitled British Colonial Slavery Compared with That of Pagan Antiquity. You can find it on Google Books. 
um, in his pamphlet, he argued that slavery was a much harsher regime in the time of Jesus Christ, but that neither Jesus nor his disciples had preached in favour of its abolition. Um, so Benjamin Green left Bowie for London in 1836. He also left behind a number of nasty libel cases relating to his ownership of the newspaper. So um, on moving to London, he lived at 45 Russell Square and he worked to develop a new business as a West India merchant. By this time, he already owns the St Kitts Estates. He was joined by his son, Benjamin Buck Green, who I'm gonna call Benjamin Junior because it's shorter. The company offices were on Mincing Lane, 11 Mincing Lane in the city. So here's Mincing Lane in the early 19th century and this is Mincing Lane today. The new West India Merchant Company um, were, um, were importing sugar from um, the Caribbean and uh, across and from um, other from South America and from Mauritius as well. And um, Benjamin Junior later partnered with his brothers-in-law as merchants and ship owners and specialized importing on in importing sugar in particular from Mauritius. And they also bought a sugar estate in Mauritius. This is after emancipation. And here is Benjamin Buck Green, um, the eldest son. It was under the management of Benjamin Buck Green, Benjamin Jr, that the family's involvement in Caribbean plantation management really took off. Benjamin Jr moved to St Kitts in 1829, aged 21, to oversee the St Kitts estates. And this was a common pattern. So you send out a son to learn the trade in his early and adventurous years, and he gains an understanding of sugar cultivation and also cements personal connections with people on the island and also sets up a system of trust where you, your son is out there so you know that your manager is not, is not defrauding you. Benjamin Green was a man very like his father. He was intelligent, hardworking, quick to take up new opportunities and strongly pro-slavery. He explored new cultivation methods and Benjamin Senior bought up new, more estates. Benjamin Jr. took on management of the estates of the Molyneux family and of other planters as well. Briefly in the mid 1830s, he was managing 16 to 18 properties and responsible for a third of the island's sugar production. The Greens attempted to mitigate their reliance on labor in the aftermath of emancipation with steam mills and improved livestock. Benjamin Jr. returned to Britain in 1837 and Benjamin Senior's fourth son, Charles, took his place in St Kitts. The fifth son, William, joined Charles in St Kitts in 1839, aged just 15, and Charles died of yellow fever in St Kitts the following year. The Green's management of the properties appeared to have ensured higher profits than most planters in a period of economic decline. This is a map of St Kitts from 1828, just to show the main um, family properties. Benjamin Jr. testified to a House of Commons committee in 1848 that the families Cranston, here we are, and Nicola Town estates were bringing Benjamin Sr. an average income of £3,000 a year every year between 1838 and 1846. On the death of Charles V's son, William took over management in St Kitts. But he was the only one of the sons who lacked his father's business sense. But then by the 1840s, the ending of sugar duties and a, and a decline in sugar yields, among other things, meant that Benjamin Senior um, ensured a gradual family withdrawal from the Caribbean investments. Oops, sorry about that. I've gone the wrong way. Benjamin Senior died in 1860 and left his remaining West India property to all of his many grandchildren. Modest dividends were paid out in the 1860s and 1870s, but by the 1890s the estates were run down and in trouble, while the income from the estates was being shared out between over 50 different beneficiaries. The Nicola Town estate was sold in 1893 and Cranston was sold in 1897. But the notion of ties to the Caribbean, often romantic, lived on in the family. 
William, the youngest son, later described his early years in St Kitts as the most cheerful, careless and happy period of my life. In 1881, he returned to St Kitts and he died there soon after. William's grandson was Graham Greene, one of the greatest English novelists of the 20th century. Graham Greene wrote two novels set in the Caribbean, The Comedians and Our Man in Havana. Greene's autobiography, A Sort of Life, relates a family legend about Charles Greene, his great uncle. So Charles Greene moved to St Kitts in 1837 and he died there at the age of 19 in 1840. But according to um, Graham Greene's um, description of the family legend, Charles um, left behind 13 children in St Kitts on his death. And Graham Greene refers to these children as the coloured greens. This is how Graham Greene, um, in his autobiography, A Sort of Life, described romantically his grandfather's return to St Kitts. We always leave too soon the coral islands where we have been happily wrecked, but the memories of Mount Misery with its head buried in the clouds, of the green wastes of sugar cane, the black sands of Dieppe Bay, of the little church of Christchurch outside which his brother lay under a grey slab of stone, were powerful enough to draw back the middle-aged man from the family life at Bedford. And Graham Greene um, Graham Greene says that the family member he most uh, identifies with is his grandfather William. And when he, as a teenager, when Graham Greene had a personal awakening and considered himself superior to everybody else, as some teenagers do, um, he um, described this in with reference to Williams's experiences in St Kitts. So he writes, had my grandfather returned to England from the long morning rides among the sugar canes and the black labourers of St Kitts with the same exhilarating and unbalanced sense of superiority. So where is the brewery in all of this? Where's Green King? You might assume that the brewery was using slave grown sugar, distilling spirits and closely connected to the Green's Caribbean investments, but this was not the case at all. Benjamin Green's third son, Edward Green, and this is him, joined the family brewing business in 1820 at the age of 15. By 1834, he was managing the property and in 1836, his father sold the whole business to him with a loan that Edward in time paid off. According to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, uh, Edward completely transformed the business, the brewing business, between 1840 and 1870. He organised a system of agents and travellers to arrange contracts with public houses. He moved production from the traditional heavy ales to the pale ales. Um, this is the Westgate Brewery in the 1880s. You can contrast this with the 1839 image that we saw earlier. By the 1870s, the Westgate Brewery was producing over 40,000 barrels a year. Edward merged the business with that of his neighbour, Frederick William King in 1887, becoming Green King. The new company increasingly bought and leased pubs to sell their beer on their own account. They oversaw 200 pubs in 1887 and 460 in 1919. The rise of the brewery and the later, the, the rise of the brewery in the later 19th century contrasts with the demise of the West India estates. So what were the similarities in the development of the West India investments and the development of the brewery? There's a difficult to quantify possible cross-pollination between the profits gained by Benjamin Senior in the Caribbean and the development of the brewing business in Suffolk, but it was the Greens' later highly profitable role as shipping agents in the Mauritius sugar trade that, um, that really set this branch of the family, that, that really um, set up the fortunes of this branch of the family as yields and profits in the Caribbean were declining. Um, the West India merchant business was clearly connected to Benjamin Junior's early lessons in sugar production and trade in the Caribbean. Another common theme among the different branches of the family is their increased social standing and political power as their financial fortunes were raised. 
Edward Green became an MP and Benjamin Junior became governor of the Bank of England. Both sides of the family invested in country houses and cemented their positions in the British ruling class. The non-brewing, um, here we got, this is Edward Green's country house and this is Benjamin Junior's country house, which has now been knocked down. The non-brewing greens were part of the fabric of London society. Benjamin Senior lived at 45 Russell Square. Benjamin Junior lived at 52 Woburn Place, both in Bloomsbury, just around the corner from UCL. So here is Russell Square around 1830. This is um, the unveiling of the statue of the Duke of Bedford in 1830. And this is Woburn Place today. Later members of the family were able to combine obvious talents with their accumulated social and educational capital. Sir William Graham Greene was a government minister in the 1910s. Uh, Sir Hugh Carlton Greene was a celebrated journalist and broadcaster, uh, with the novelist Graham Greene as well, who we've already talked about. So points to note about the Greens. The connection between the development of Green King as a business and the forced labour of enslaved people in the Caribbean is not a straightforward one. It can be difficult to separate slave derived wealth from other sources. And again, as with the Whiteman sons, this isn't just about wealth, as in um, the shifting of large pots of money. It's also about softer forms of capital, connections, expectations, education that can then be redeployed in other parts of the empire. The Green family provide an example of the rapid rise of a hard nosed, entrepreneurial, even ruthless family in times of industrial and commercial change and their political opinions are bound up with, um, with their economic activities. And with the structure of these opportunities, within these, the structure of these opportunities, family networks of trust and mutuality were of crucial importance. And finally, the fortunes and the networks of these powerful families persist. The end of slavery is not the end of, of the legacies for these families. Right, finally, I want to talk um, very briefly, well, for about five minutes about um, the Beckfords and about memorialization in particular, and then I'll pass back to um, Matthew Smith. The basic story of the Beckfords is well known. Peter Beckford traveled to Jamaica in 1661 in his late teens. Here he is, Peter. Um, not long after the British had first invaded the island. So this is 1661, 120 years before the birth of, um, of Benjamin Green Senior. Peter's early years in Jamaica are obscure, but he acquired a huge fortune and was a key figure in the early development of sugar cultivation on the island. Nine years after arriving in Jamaica, he owned over 2,000 acres in Clarendon, and five years after that, he was elected to the Jamaican House of Assembly. He died suddenly in a fracas in government house in Spanish town. By the, but by the time of his death in 1710, he, he owned over 1,200 enslaved people and had one and a half million pounds reportedly in bank stock. He'd begun what the ODMB describes as the greatest sugar fortune in the West Indies. His eldest son also, oh, I've skipped again, right? There we are. His eldest son here, also named Peter, was a prominent member of the House of Assembly and he also shared his father's um, temper and volatility. At the time of his death in 1735, he owned nine estates and 1,669 enslaved people. The eldest, well, um, the best known son of um, Peter Jr. was old man William Beckford. William entered Balliol College in Oxford and he studied medicine in Leiden and Paris. And then he returned to his father to Jamaica on the death of his father and he took an active role in Jamaican politics. Also, the death of um, William's eldest brother meant that William became the main heir of his father's estates, but still William returned to London in 1744. In Britain, William bought the Font Hill estate in Wiltshire. He also had a townhouse in London at 22 Soho Square, 
and he collected art and books and racehorses. His library had over 1,500 volumes in it. And why he's best known is, um, well, for all kinds of reasons, but he became an MP in 1747 and he remained an MP for the rest of his life. He was an older man in London in 1752 and Sheriff of London in 1755. He was Lord Mayor of London twice in the 1760s. And after his death in 1770, a statue was commissioned in his memory to be placed in the Guildhall in London. It was still there early this year. And here's the statue of him in the Guildhall. Earlier this year, the City of London Corporation voted to remove the statue of Beckford, calling it a stain on our history. A government spokesman responded with this comment. This is the comment of the government spokesman. Any removal should require planning permission and local people given the chance to be properly consulted. That's why we are changing the law to protect historic monuments to ensure we don't repeat the errors of previous generations. So this is the last development I can find in it. So I'm guessing it's still to be re resolved. William Beckford has been described as the uncrowned King of Jamaica and also the first prime minister of the London empire. It's difficult to overstate the level of wealth created by the Beckfords in the 17th and 18th centuries. William died when, William died when his only son, William Thomas, here's William Thomas, was just 10 years old. There's a lot that you can say about William Thomas, but I'm just gonna be very brief. Um, William Thomas um, celebrated turning the 21 in um, 1781, with a party at Font Hill costing £40,000. To give you an idea of the scale of the Beckford land holdings and slave holdings, I've got two slides quickly to show. Um, William and his brothers, um, Richard, Francis and Julian, owned 31 estates in Jamaica and I've plotted 17 of them on this map. This is a uh, James Robertson's map from 1804. But so these are the estates that um, William Beckford and his brothers had owned 40 years previously. Um, so the 17 that I plotted and they're all sugar estates. So they're all substantial properties. And here is the slave holding according to probate records of Peter Jr. and his sons, Richard, Julian and William. There is another son as well, Francis, whose probate records I can't find. So Peter Jr. owned, as I said before, 1,669 enslaved people. Richard, at the time of his death, owned 910 enslaved people. Julian um, owned 662, and William, the Lord Mayor of London and MP in Britain, owned 1,356 enslaved people. William Thomas, William's son, derived an extraordinary income from the sugar estates he inherited from his father. One of his um, projects was the, was the building of Font Hill Abbey. So here is a picture of it. This spire is 300 feet tall, but it was unstable. And while it was still being built, while the building was being finished, uh, um, it fell down. By the 1820s, William Thomas's income was in freefall while his debts on Font Hill were spiraling. He died in Bath, the place Bath, not the Bath, in 1844, leaving a personal estate of 80,000 pounds. So this is, a, this is greatly reduced wealth now, even though it's still a very large sum, but his annual income was higher than that every year when he first inherited the estates. William Thomas Beckford had two legitimate daughters and his main heir was his daughter Susan because the other one had run off, had eloped. So she was um, not in favor as much. And this is Susan who married the 10th Duke of Hamilton in 1810. Therefore the remaining fortune of this line of the Jamaican Beckfords passed into the aristocracy. Here are the Beckfords in the slave compensation records and I've just cut and pasted this from um, the LBS database. So here is William Thomas Beckford with the four estates he owned at the time of emancipation. Um, and I mean, there's quite a few Beckfords in the LBS database. Then this family 
the Love Beckfords and William are um, the children of Francis, another one of the sons of, um, of Peter Jr. This is my last slide. The name Beckford lives on in Jamaica and in Britain in many different guises. In July 2020, Beckford Primary School in Hampstead was the subject of a campaign from parents, pupils and other protesters. It had apparently been named after the Beckford family in the 1920s. So this is an early 20th century commemoration of um, an 18th and 19th century slave owning family. From this September, it will be renamed West Hampstead Primary. The celebrated novelist and educator Beryl Gilroy was the deputy head and then the head teacher of the school from 1968. She was the first black head teacher in London. And now I'm going to pass over to Matt. Thank you, Rachel. I'm going to highlight one of the important elements to think about when we look at the legacies of slavery in the Caribbean. And that is the way in which many of the the sorts of uh, remnants of slavery are carried through consciously and unconsciously in the landscape and in the people. I'd be looking at a family known as the Beckfords, but these are black Beckfords. These are not Beckfords who are white, who were uh, part of the British aristocracy and uh, politics. In fact, the connections between the Beckfords that I will highlight here are with the Beckfords that Rachel just went over uh, are not clear. We don't no, and in fact, it's probably doubtful that there are ties to them directly. However, the name is important. The Beckford that you'll see on the slide here at the very top is Reverend Charles Beckford, who was part of a very prominent family of Beckfords in the parish of St. Anne. Now that red section of the map of Jamaica is the northern parish of St. Anne, one of the larger parishes in the island of Jamaica and also a parish of great historical and international import. It is from St. Anne that some of the more famous Jamaicans actually have roots. Uh, Harry Belafonte's family is from St. Anne, a peasant village in the central part of the parish. Uh, US Vi Vice President Kamala Brown's family is also from St. Anne, Brownstown. Uh, Marcus Garvey, perhaps the most famous Jamaican of the last century, uh, at least in terms of the large scale impact he's had uh, on black developments and uh, black national and black power movements was also from St. Anne. The Garvey family was from St. Anne's Bay. And uh, last, but by far no means least, was Robert Nesta Marley, Bob Marley, whose family, the Malcolms, came from St. Anne as well in the area known as Roden Hall or more popularly Nine Mile. All of these families I've just named were families that really began to develop more uh, in the period after slavery. So they're part of that longer legacy of slavery that we've been tracing throughout this presentation. And they developed in uh, rural communities, more in the hillside areas of uh, the parish of St. Anne. If you recall a map that we saw a few moments ago from Rachel, she showed that the Beckford family, the William Beckford family had uh, some properties, some estates in St. Anne in Drax Hall along the coast. Uh, looking at the map just below, you'll see that there are uh, these other areas further from the coast going to the southern part of the, um, of the parish. And one of those very prominent at the very bottom of the map is a community known as Bensonton. And it is there in Bensonton in a uh, hilly rural farming community uh, that the Beckfords that I'm highlighting here uh, emerge from. Reverend Charles Beckford was born in 1894 clearly a descendant of enslaved people. His family became quite uh, prominent in uh, the small town of Bensonton. He was a clergyman, a Moravian, uh, did very well uh, in, that, in that field. Uh, one of his children, one of his sons was uh, Professor George Beckford, a very significant figure. Uh, and another, I should say, another prominent Jamaican to emerge from St. Anne. George Beckford, I would, I would add, along with Arthur Lewis from St. Lucia, are two of the four most political economists to come out of the Caribbean. And George Beckford was not only someone who emerged from the Jamaican peasantry, but someone who studied the Jamaican peasantry very, very closely in his work and also in his active life. He, he was a professor at the University of the West Indies, was trained in the United States, uh, and also would continue to be very much involved with uh, peasant activities and uh, cooperatives uh, in Jamaica during his lifetime. Next slide, please, Rachel. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. And I think it's really important that we end our presentation with the words of George Beckford because they really highlight what we see as the strong and lasting legacy of slavery, uh, as we see it particularly in the Caribbean. George Beckford's most famous work was a book that he published in 1975 called Persistent Poverty, in which he looked at the reasons for economic problems, economic underdevelopment, as he called it, in uh, the Caribbean and said a lot of it has to do with the legacy of the plantation system in the Caribbean. And I have two quotes here that I think are great ways to uh, wrap up all of what we've been uh, highlighting this evening. The question which we must, sorry, the question which we must seek to answer is why? Why have the plantation economies been left behind? Why is it that after 400 years of direction, participation in the modern world economy, the plantation economies of the world still find themselves on the developed countries with the bulk of their inhabitants living rather existing in the most wretched conditions of poverty. And uh, before the book came out, he wrote an essay from which I've taken this other quote. Although slavery has been formally abolished for about four generations or so, the basic structure of plantation society in the new world remains today, very much what it was during slavery. And elsewhere in his work, he's highlighted the social implications of that as well as the economic. The reasons for this are not very hard to find. The white planter class monopolized the means of production on the land and were therefore in a position to maintain their dominant position. And that I think uh, speaks volumes to the conditions that the Caribbean found itself in after slavery, but also to these very knotted ties that exist uh, across the centuries. On the one hand, the white Beckfords who were referred to, one of who was referred to in the previous, in the previous slide that Rachel mentioned as the King of Jamaica. And on the other hand, George Beckford critiquing the plantation model and also exposing the threads in which its legacies continue to be felt in the region today. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to take a couple of questions. We've got a bunch of questions in the chat for both Matt and Rachel, I suppose. So question from Mike Tuffy says, can you say some more about the Commission for Incumbent Estate is an example of continuing exploitation aiming to protect the interests of estate owners? Rachel? Matt, would you like to take that one? <laughs> I, 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 could you repeat it, Tony? Can you say some more about the Commission for Encumbered estate, Estates is an example of continuing exploitation aiming to protect the interests of estate owners? I, I can't, and I, I, I apologize to the, to, the part, to the member of the audience who's asked the question. I, I cannot answer that question um, right now. It, it's, and I, I think it's something worth following up on. So, you know, we, we would invite you to just drop us an email where we could have time to think about that a bit more and, and give you a more fulsome uh, response. Elizabeth says, do you know the name of the sugar estate in Mauritius that Benjamin Book owned? Sorry, no. Um, I will find it out for you though, if I can. Mm -hmm. Can you type in the, um, the LBS um, website into the chat box, please? Certainly, and our email, I think we'll put that in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to do that? Thank you, Rachel. Can a link be provided for, this is, hang on, sorry, I just missed this step there because the questions are coming in thick and fast and some questions were there for 20 minutes before we actually got the Q&A session. Let me get, yeah, um, Leslie says, can a link be provided for the Google Books, Benjamin Green and William Berman's book at the Library of Congress? So Benjamin, well, Benjamin Green, you can just Google yourself, I have a thought, but William Berman's books at the Library of Congress, that might be a bit... It, it's the uh, sketches. Yeah, just give me a second to get it, and I'll, uh, but I will post it, yeah. Renee says, thank you for the workshop, it's been a very, very helpful. Um, let's see now. Uh, the brother of Graham Green's father was Edward Green. I'm living in a house in Berkhamstead, England, which was owned by, the, by this Edward Green in the 1930s. That's what's going to be called me, you know what I mean? There's another question. What is an MP? An MP is a member of parliament for those who are not from the UK. Yes, it is being recorded. So this session has been recorded. We sent to people who are registered. And I should tell you that about 
2,000 people wanted to come to this event. So we had about six, 1,600 people registered and then there were seven people on the um, waiting list. So um, there was a huge number of people interested in actually attending and some of you got through. So another question here. Any surviving Beckfords? That's from, from Louisa. Are there any surviving Beckfords? Well, um, not, not named Beckford through the line um, that I spoke about through um, Peter Senior, Peter Junior. Um, the, the money went into the, the remaining fortune, went into um, the Dukes of Hamilton. Okay. Question from Leslie. What is the connection of the Beckfords to the Draxes? I noticed one of the estates you just showed was captioned Drax Hall. Any connection to the current MP Drax? Yes. Richard Drax, um, I think he's a descendant, yes. And he did own, I think he owned, uh, and uh, he inherited in the last few years an estate um, in Jamaica, I think, from his family. Um, he's had some words to say about his connections that you can find them online. All right, a uh, question from Jerry. And he says to you, Rachel, what was the cost of manumission? It varied hugely in different places and at different times. So um, when manumission was seen as a threat, the cost was higher, um, was about 100 pounds or even 200 or up to 300 pounds at, at different times. Um, it was also the case that there were concerns about the growth, the expansion of the free um, population of color, which, um, and in Barbados, for example, to try to limit this, it cost twice as much money to manumit a woman as it did to manumit a man, because they're, they're trying to um, control and contain the, the free population of colour. So, but in the run-up to emancipation, the fees for manumission um, were reduced or even, um, or even abolished in some places. There was an alternative as well, which was to manumit people in Britain which was cheaper. You, ju you just needed to pay for, for a legal deed. Um, so that was um, done to some extent. There were ways around the costs of manumission, but for most of the period, um, it, was, it was high. The um, yeah, um, in the way that the cost of um, purchasing some an enslaved person was high, that you add to that really significantly with manumission. Okay. So just in case you're waiting for your question to be asked, I have to tell you that there's like over 300 people in this um, chat box and there's about 60 questions. So I'll go through some that I can get in the time we have available. Um, a few comments here for you. Um, wonderful presentation, it passed very quickly. Thank you so much. Thanks presentation, uh, amazing. Uh, RT and Lyle still adamant they did not profit from the transatlantic transatlantic slave trade. That's from ID Day. Tate and Lyle, are they in your database, guys? Well, um, I think Tate and Lyle's rationale behind saying that they didn't is that the, um, I think the business was started in the 1860s or thereabouts. So the, the real fast growth of Tate and Lyle happened post emancipation. But they were um, um, they were transporting and selling sugar from um, countries that that still had um, that still had slavery, like Cuba, for example, and and some countries in South America. So I think their way of saying they weren't involved was the chronology that they came into the business quite late. Travis says, "Can you share more about how we can use the legacies of British slavery website to connect our family to the plantations?" I'm interested particularly in Jamaican estates. Um, one, um, a few different ways. One way is to use our maps function. So in the top um, menu bar of the website, um, there's a section maps. So if you click on, um, if you, shall I, um, Zoo, shall I share my screen? I should, well, I suppose we have a lot of questions. What okay. I would add, what I would add, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. You click on the maps function, go to the map of Jamaica, then you can search um, areas, but we only have sugar estates on the map at the moment, but we have several hundred estates there. And if you click on each round white circle on the map, it will take you to information 
about the estates. In that information about the estates, you'll find an indexed set of slave registers. So you'll only find the index, you won't find the full entry of the slave registers. You'll find um, the, the page number to go to. And at the moment, you can only find the slave registers on Ancestry. So that's the way to do it, quite a complicated way around it. We, we are um, also in the process of putting together these video guides, which should sort of walk users through how to use the, uh, the database to find people, uh, places, uh, those sorts of things. So stay tuned, keep checking on the website. You can subscribe to our newsletter as well. If you want to email us, then um, in our newsletter, it goes out about every six weeks. We have, um, we list latest events and also any updates on the database. Right. Yeah, and just to remind people that if you're making comments, please be respectful. Please be respectful, otherwise you can be kicked out of the chat box. Um, someone says, excellent presentation. Robert Beckton is also the author of Small Garden Bitter Weed, an economic analysis of Jamaica. That's George Beckford, not Robert. Oh, yes, sorry. correct. <laughs> George Beckford. Yeah, he co-wrote that with Michael Witter. Ah, Michael Witter. He's a professor, I think, didn't he? Retired now, but yes, also a political economist from Jamaica. So we've got time. Got time for a few more questions because there's about eighty questions in the in the chat. In the I should also just say quickly, Tony, that you know we'll also do our best after this to to answer what we can in the chat. So. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, let me just take a couple more. Um, someone says, Mr. Campion or Miss Campion says, Drax currently has a working sugar plantation in Barbados. Indeed, that, I believe that's quite true. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, so I'm going to have to wind up this Q&A. There'll be another Q&A when I've done my presentation, if we have time for that even. But yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of questions in this uh, chat box. We can't possibly answer all of them. Um, in the time we have available. So I'm gonna finish that particular Q&A now, but bear in mind, we'll probably do this again in the future and then maybe have a longer time because there's certainly a lot of interest in, in the topic there. Um, so for now, let me just uh, do my little bit of sharing. Hold on a second. We have to kind of uh, change screens. All right, Rachel, can you see my screen? Is it up there now? Yes. All right, so we're going to have another Q&A shortly. We're going to go through a few things to do with um, London's history, London street history, and also the links to the Caribbean, Africa as well. So this is a short, quick look at what we do. So Black History Walks runs walks, talks, and films on Black history each month of the year for the last 14 years. For the last 14 years, we do something like this, either a physical talk or online talk or a guided walk or a film, etc. every single month since 2007. We also show, well, we show films at the BFI, which is a big cinema not far from Waterloo Tube Station. These are some of the films we've been shown for the last 14 years. You might not recognize most of the images there because these are films that are not normally shown by mainstream cinemas. So you don't see an Odeon or, or um, um, Cineworld for some reason, probably because they have, you know, positive African content, but we show these kind of films regular basis at the BFI all year long. It's called the African Odysseys Program. We've got 12 different walks in North, East, South, West London, and we basically take people for, you know, roughly a two hour guided tour of different parts of the capital and show them all of the African and Caribbean history in those streets. And today you're gonna get a sample of that for a certain area in London. And apart from all that, we have a Black History River cruise. So we have a boat, um, goes up and down River Thames and while we're on the boat we show you the history alongside the River Thames and we also have characters in costume who are portraying actual historical characters from history like Phyllis Wheatley or Nanny Maroons and they also speak about their history. The next one's going to take place on the 3rd of July. Now the first time we did this event was back in 2013. This is a clip from that um, session and just listen to um, the question from the audience. Is it what we found in, in network? The numbers of people who are engaged, not simply as individuals, they're engaged as members of families. In this case, all having a stake in one way or another uh, uh, in slave ownership. Uh, but the relations of people, for example, 
Uh, there's a man I've been particularly interested in, who's Philip John Miles, who's MP in Bristol, and his son, although not a direct slave owner and beneficiary of compensation, is also an MP and indeed a leading figure defending the West India interest of Parliament of the 1840s, uh, uh, defending planter interests. Those kinds of networks of familial relationship in one way or another are one of the things that you can track through uh, this data. Do you feel that disturbed the hornet's nest? I hope so. <laughs> so the question I asked there was, do you feel this has disturbed a hornet's nest? And that's often a comment that comes up when we discuss these issues. If you look at the chat, you can see that there's lots of um, buzzing going on right now. So we're going to have a look at this hornet's nest with regard to the physical layout of a certain part of London. So St. Paul's Cathedral is an uh, internationally well-known, iconic um, uh, piece of architecture. And it's right next to St. Paul's Tube Station, which is what it's actually called St. Paul's. And next to St. Paul's is a street called Cheapside. Here's a close-up of, of Cheapside, the street. And Cheapside at one time was a big, long, open market, and it had streets off it like Bread Street and Milk Street, where you go to buy bread and milk. So this is a street in London called Cheapside. Let's go to Barbados in the Caribbean. Let's go to the capital of this place called Bridgetown and see what we can find there. And in Bridgetown, you can find an area called Cheapside as well. That's interesting. And guess what? Cheapside is also a big, massive market. So that might be a coincidence, or maybe there's a bit more to it. But you've got a place called Cheapside, which is a market in Barbados. And not far from Cheapside, you can see this place called Kensington Oval. So let's look at that. So in Barbados, you have a place called Kenton Oval. I wonder if there's any connection with this country, with London. Maybe it's just a fluke. This is a beach, a very popular beach in the island of Barbados. What's it called? It's called Brighton Beach. So what's happening is that the people who have colonized or invaded the Caribbean have taken their history with them and they've renamed certain areas after places they missed back home. So you can go to the Caribbean, any English speaking island, and find all these remnants of of, of names of British history, which means that that original history of the area has been somewhat erased because I should say they actually renamed certain areas because those areas had their own names prior to the English or Portuguese or Spanish arriving there, but they were all renamed or mostly renamed with these, these European um, uh, uh, names, as you can see there. And that renaming links into colonization. So there's one part of colonization is a colonization of the actual land. The other part is a colonization of the memory. And what we do is we try and uncolonize or decolonize that memory to give people back the history that was there prior to European empires. To give you a comparison, or give you a comparison for this particular uh, beach, this is um, Brighton Beach. And as you can see, they have some nice big rocks to land. And that's the, that's the beach you could find here in Brighton, which then gives the name to Brighton Beach in the Caribbean, or Barbados actually in this case. From Barbados, let's go to Jamaica. So look at Jamaica and see what we can find there. In Jamaica, you can find areas called Cornwall, Middlesex, and Surrey. There's even a Manchester just there as well. So if you're from this country, you know there's areas in this country called Cornwall, Middlesex, and Surrey. And again, it links to the whole idea of colonization in that even the names of a certain area can be replaced and, uh, and erase the actual original history, the African history, the Caribbean history, or need the indigenous history there. So part of reclaiming this history is to find out what things were called before they were called the present colonization, colonization, colonization name. So between St. Paul's, which is over here, and Bank, which is down there, that's, a, that's the road called Cheapside, which you'd walk down to get to the bank. Now, Bank Cheap Station is called Bank because it's next to the Bank of England. So now we're going to look at the Bank of England, see if there's any black history in the Bank of England. This is an interview with Mr. Keyworth, who was the curator of the Bank of England Museum. And he's going to talk about the African history, black history in the Bank of England. He did this about 10 years ago. Most of Britain's towns and cities have a trading or financial area. I'm here in one of the most powerful financial districts in the world. 
This part of London is known as the City of London and it's interesting that here in this great trading epicenter there's rich evidence of black history. I'm in the Bank of England, one of the most important banks in Britain. This bank was set up in 1694. Before that time, money was controlled by the goldsmiths. They'd make items from gold, they'd even lend money to the king. But where was all this gold coming from? I'm holding a real solid gold bar. It's incredibly heavy. Some of Britain's earliest trading power came from a wealth of gold extracted from Africa. In 1325, Timbuktu in Mali was one of the biggest centers of trade in the world. The markets there brought in merchants from Nigeria, Egypt, Venice and Genoa, where they traded manufactured goods for gold. Timbuktu was ruled by the generous African king of Mali, Mansa Musa. He was richer than all the kings of Europe and was probably the richest man in the world at the time. One of the first British mass-produced gold coins takes its name from the region of West Africa where much of the gold used to make the coin originated. Well, in 1663, a new coin was introduced. It was gold, originally intended to be valued at one pound. The gold in it was just below the face value of the coin, but the value of gold was fluctuating so wildly at that time that the value of this coin actually went as high as 30 shillings, that's £1.50 in today's money, and it was called a guinea because the gold came from the Guinea coast of Africa, it originated from there. And this gold then came back to Britain and it drove the economy of Britain, or helped to drive it, it wasn't the only force, mm. I mean, there were other factors, but it was, it was a major force. In times of crisis, people always want gold. Yeah. Yeah. If you look back at history, every time there's been a war, the price of gold has gone up. So, Bank of England, one time was literally full of African gold, and some of that gold is still there, and that's what gave rise to the naming of a certain coin um, as the Guinea coin, because the gold to make that coin came from the Guinea coast of Africa. And if you watch those period dramas, they're often referred to the Guinea as unit currency because it was unit currency for a very long time. In fact, let's look at where in Africa that gold came from. So this is a modern map of Africa. We're looking at West Africa. In fact, even now, if you can see my cursor, you can see there's a place called Guinea here, and there's a place called Guinea-Bissau here as well. We're going to go back about 300 years, and you can see this map is from 1736 prior to European colonization of Africa, the different nations called Nigeria and Chad, et cetera. This is prior to that time. You can see there's a whole huge area called Negro land, which is interesting. Then you have an area called Guinea, which includes the Gold Coast. Why was it called the Gold Coast? Because that's where the British were getting their gold from. And that's why that coin that's produced in the UK was called the Guinea because the gold to make that coin came from the Guinea coast of Africa. So you have a literal direct connection between Africa and the Bank of England, and that goal, that money helped to drive the economy and become part of British society. So that's one obvious connection when it comes to the black history in the Bank of England, but there's, there's a lot more we can look at. So you can read that for yourselves, but the Royal African Company was very active in the slave or so-called slave trade, the kidnapping business. And the money from that so-called business ends up in different European capitals, be it France or Portugal, or in this case, Britain. That money ends up here in the city of London, which is where the banking is situated. So that's the Guildhall. The Guildhall is a place, well, it's not far from cheap, but it's in that red circle. We're we'll going to look at the guild on and see how that links into another aspect of black history. That's what the guild hall looks like if you go there. Um, that's the exterior view. 
And there's an interesting statue within that building, which um, Richard referred to earlier on. But that company used to meet in the guild hall. The Royal African Company used to meet in the guild hall. And within that guild hall, there is, at the moment at least, a statue of Mr. William Beckford. So the history is right there. It's um, you know on plain display. Um, it, it's not that well known, mind you, but it is physically there. So from the Guild Hall in the city, let's go to Trafalgar Square, because just north of Trafalgar Square, you can find a place called the National Portrait Gallery. So there's two galleries there. The National Gallery is this one. We're looking at the National Portrait Gallery. If you go into the gallery, although it's closed at the moment, go to the top floor at the back, you'll find this image. So let's take a moment to look at this picture and see if we can work out where is the African man, where's the black man? There's actually four black men in this image, but we can, I think we can see the one in the center on the chair who is back to us. And this is a huge painting. It's a, a really interesting painting. So let's find out a bit about this painting, which you can find in the National Portrait Gallery. It's titled the Anti-Slavery Society Convention of 1840. And there were men in, um, actually women as well, men and women in this um, image, which is a real meeting from the Caribbean. You had representatives from Barbados, from Jamaica, and from Haiti. We're gonna look at one of these individuals, but should also mention this man, Charles Lennox Raymond, who was the brother of Sarah Parker Raymond. He was actually at this meeting in London in the 1840s. He was basically a freedom fighter. Uh, he was a bit like Frederick Douglass before Frederick Douglass was Frederick Douglass. And he spoke out for equality and justice, not just in America, but also over here. And he was the brother of Sarah Parker Raymond after whom the Sarah Parker Raymond Center is named after. But let me get back to the painting and talk about Mr. Um, the, the guy, this guy right here. Oh, I should actually mention that in the future we have a whole event to explain who Sarah Parker Raymond is. It's on the 5th of June with Professor Serpa Salinas going to give us a talk about Sarah Parker Raymond and explain why she's such a kind of a, a superheroine. But going back to our image, if you look at the NPG website for the people in the image, are all um, identified. Well, not all of them, but some of them are identified. And the picture you were looking at, the man black one you were looking at in the previous picture, his name is Henry Beckford. So Henry Beckford was an enslaved African who he was freed, and he actually was had left Jamaica to come over here to be to participate in this abolitionist meeting. So that's an interesting connection between um, uh, emancipation, between political activity between international travel and the actual fact that he was actually in the UK from Jamaica with the name Beckford is interesting. And that's the person you're seeing here in the center. But there's more, there are other Beckfords to look at. So that's another connection to the Beckford name. Somebody in the chat mentioned Robert Beckford and Robert Beckford was on TV back in the early 2000s. He had a whole bunch of different programs, including one where he actually traced his family back to um, a certain part of Jamaica um, he asked them about their name, if they were proud of the name Beckford, and he found out that the, the white Beckford was actually buried in the church, at the front of the church. And he was so angry, he said he wanted to kind of spit in the grave. But that's another example of how you have this, this connection between Jamaica and the UK and the Beckford name. And this particular man is a doctor, an academic, a TV historian, etc., and has done a massive amount of work to kind of raise the awareness of this type of hidden story. In fact, he's the person who kind of exposed the fact that um, the Beckford statue was in the guild in the first place. He actually goes there and films and talks about how he feels about this statue being there. And that was back in, that was like 2007 or something like that. It was early, much earlier than, than uh, now. And the other Beckford we should mention is um, the Beckford that Mr. Dr. Sorry, Professor Smith uh, referred to, George Beckford who is more or less on the level of Walter Rodney when it comes to analyzing how poverty is institutionalized and maintained. So if you want to get a book to understand how this system operates and why the things are the way they are, you can get George Beckford's book. You can also get Walter Rodney's book. These are the books that um, help to explain the situation we're also in. 
But you can also check out the books of Professor Paul Gilroy, who heads up the Sarah Parker in One Center at UCL. In a Black Union Jack, classic, Black Atlantic, another classic, Black Britain. Um, not that well known, but it's a great book for looking at uh, fantastic images. And Paul Gilroy, After Empire. Equiano was an enslaved African who freed himself. So this guy had an amazing career. He was a hairdresser. He was a freedom fighter. He was an abolitionist. He actually um, sailed to the um, North Pole and saw polar bears. And he used to live in London and published this book. This book was published in 1789. He was part of a group of men called the Sons of Africa, who were all free African men who used their time and money to actually campaign against white supremacy, against racism. And if you look at the right-hand side, you can see that for the London, um, just underneath, underneath where it says London, you can see he was selling his books at St. Paul's Churchyard. He was selling his books in Fleet Street and Bond Street. So this is another London connection. This man was all over this ca uh, capital city, London, selling his books and fighting for equality. And he was an African man who freed himself from his labor. So his story needs to be much, much better known than it actually is at the moment. But Equiano links in the case of the Zong. And the Zong is a really important and famous case where a ship's captain threw overboard 130 African people in order to claim insurance for them. So a scandalous situation at the time and even now. And the trial of the Zong, as you can read there, this dispute was initially tried at the Guildhall in London on 6th of March, 1783. So that's another huge story there. If you're interested, you can check out the book by Mr. James Walvin called The Zong that will uh, provide a lot more information we can do in the short time we have now. But the trial took place in the Guildhall and Equiano would have been in the Guildhall in the 1780s. So within a 10 minute walk, you got masses of African black history between the Guildhall, the Bank of England, there's just so much history and that's just a little piece of it. So when we do our walks across London, this is sort of stuff we're pulling out. Um, there's just so much of it that we can, we can just a little touch on it here. Sir Humphrey Morris is a very interesting character when it comes to history and money and international finance and um, slavery, because he was a major slave trader. Now you can see that this um, reference is from the BBC and it says their last date 2011, it's actually fairly old. But this information is 300 years old, but it's not that well known. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Sir Humphrey Morris and his history. Now, all the information you're looking at here that was on the BBC website, uh, was put up on the BBC website in 2011, has been around for about 300 years. In fact, there's a book by Peter Fry called Stay in Power, came in 84, I think it was, and he talks about Mr. Morris in that book. But the information you're seeing here isn't that well known, despite the fact that Humphrey Morris was a governor of the Bank of England. Humphrey Morris is also a, a major slave trader, and apart from being a slave trader, he was also a massive crook. Because if you read the last paragraph, it talks about how he actually ripped off the Bank of England for 29,000 pounds, which would be worth about 3 million pounds in today's money. And it took 43 years to pay off his, um, his debts. And some people never got their money at all. So Humphrey Morris is a major figure when it comes to uh, enslavement, when it comes to profit. He kind of is an example of how you have these um, certain people who made a lot of money from this human rights abuses of these atrocities and that money then was brought back to this country and invested in you know um, banking in finance in insurance in big houses and a whole bunch of different um, arenas but there's a lot more to Humphrey Morris than just that aspect so let's go to West Africa here's a map of West Africa you can see Ghana Togo Benin and Nigeria's over here we're going to focus on Benin and look at a place called Wida or Wida. Wida is on the coast of Benin, and you can see that it says Wida Museum of History. It used to be a Portuguese fort, which, meant used, which means it used to be a Portuguese slave trading um, edifice. But this area on the coast of West Africa, Benin, is a place called Wida. It's pronounced or Wida. And that's how it's pronounced. So in English, it would be spelled with a W, which is what happened here. The Wida Galley. So this ship, which is a slave ship, was named after that very famous enslavement port on the West African coast. It was just a different spelling. So you have Wida 
in Benin. And you have the Wither Galley, which is named after this very famous enslavement port. And this Wither Galley has lots of interconnection between um, this country, Africa, and the Caribbean. So there's a couple of fairly well-known movies which I've seen around the world. And this links in to our story in a very interesting way. Because people often wonder, well, how, how do you link Sumpery Morris and the Bank of England and London and, and money, et cetera, to this topic? How does it all connect? Well, let's check this out. This is a short clip from a documentary on pirates. Very clear here. Humphrey Morris. Let me go back a bit. This guy here, Humphrey Morris, owned the widow, the ship that we're just talking about which could make him 200,000 pounds in profit, I think it was. So again, it shows you the kind of massive money people being made from human rights abuses and atrocities. But this ship was owned by Humphrey Morris and the slave trading ships in the Caribbean were under attack by pirates. So that's interesting. And as he says there, or he says, there's no way my ship will be attacked by a bunch of pirates. Well, guess what? Alexandra Prince was the captain of the Widow when it had just left Jamaica and something happened to it. I should talk about a couple of pirates that are relevant to this story. So there's Black Sam Bellamy, who's not black, but he's called Black Sam. There's Black Caesar one, who used to be um, the second man command with Blackbeard. There's Black Caesar two, who used to hang out, from, hang out in Haiti. And then there's Blackbeard himself, who also is not black if that makes sense. So Captain Black Sam Bellamy had a secret weapon. And when he approached Humphrey Morris's ship called the Widder, his ship was smaller and less well armed than the Widder. But he had a secret weapon aboard his ship, which you'll see shortly. So the hold of the Widder was full of gold. I wonder where that gold came from. And quite apart from that, we just heard that um, Captain Sam Bellamy's ship took over a much larger, much better armed ship than his ship was because of the African people on board his ship. And the point of this is that there were African, free African men on those pirate ships. So you had black pirates in the Caribbean, in real life, not in the movies, in real life. And these black pirates were attacking ships full of enslaved Africans and freeing the enslaved Africans who then went on to become pirates as well. And that's quite apart from the Africans who were on um, plantations who ran away and sometimes joined these pirate crews. So the ship, the Widder, is a really famous shipwreck in, the, in um, certain circles. It's very well known amongst people who are into shipwrecks, etc. So back in 2011, it was on the front cover of the National Geographic. There's a whole industry around the Widder and its wreck and its history. And in fact, there's a pirate museum named after the Widder. In fact, the Widder is such a famous shipwreck. It actually has its own museum because it's the only authenticated uh, pirate wreck in the world. And the guy in charge of it, a guy called Barry Clifford, has been doing research on the wreck of the Widder and the crew of the Widder for about 30 years. He spent five years trying to find the wreck in the first place. He spent 30 years researching that ship. And he's come up with a whole bunch of information about black pirates in the Caribbean. This is Barry Clifford speaking about black pirates and also the gold which was found on some of those ships. So that's just a little bit about pirates because many people have watched that movie Pirates of the Caribbean but I'm not sure they were aware of the background of the real history of these black pirates these African pirates who were in effect rescuing enslaved Africans and then sharing the profits which they took from the slave master an amazing story not that well known but now some of us know that story can pass it on silver have to show appreciation those who, those who came before uh, me, before us. There's a guy called Nick Draper who has written or co in both of those books in the top there. He was who the person who actually assisted us with having this event in the very first place back in 2013. He said, yeah, well, he'd do it and he'd come down and bring his crew. And that was back at Burpick in 2013. Um, so I have to shout out to him because this is the root of this event is back in 2013 when he said yes. 
And I think at that time we had about 200 people in the room, whereas now we have 2,000 people want to um, attend this event. On the bottom left hand picture there, that is to the left of, sorry, Angela Davis has the microphone. To the left of Angela Davis, no pun intended, is Professor Catherine Hall, who's another major uh, um, contributor to the whole LBS program. And the man on the right hand side is called Nia Amara, and he's the person who actually assisted us to get the venue for free at Burt back in 2013. Because one of the problems we had was that we couldn't get venues to host Black History events, it was very difficult. And he, with the help of a sister called Patrice Buddington, assists us to do so. So I have to kind of show respect to people who helped us to do this event in the very first place and then to have it happening even now. And some of the stuff has been taken from our book, Black History, What's Learned in Volume 1, which is coming out from Jacaranda Books this year. So basically, some stuff here today is in our book, coming out in a couple of months' time, and it's called Black History, What's Learned in Volume 1. And finally, this is happening, and it's a fundraiser for Sarah Parker Raymond. <laughs> experience a wonderful way for us to learn our history um, it's kind of live history you know what I mean because you we're, we're, we're sailing past um, um, buildings and stuff that we've probably sailed past or driven past or walked past a hundred times never knew the significance of that building away by the boat trip I really am I didn't understand that it was actually picking out all the historical contributions that our people had made along the river and what it all meant I didn't understand that that's what was happening people got what they wanted it was a beautiful day beautiful and sunny so people had that there was the river there was a bit of drink at the bar there was loads of information from SI um, and the characters were amazing so yeah it's great I would recommend it to anybody to come all right so that's it from me for this section let me check in with Matt and Rachel um, have you got have you been dealing with any questions while I was talking Hey there. Yes, um, I've been trying to answer some questions on the chat, um, but I think they're mostly about links that I put into the chat. Okay, cool. Um, there's a link in the chat to, to take to a statue, to, sorry, there's a link in the chat to a statement that was produced by the Tate Gallery and Tate and Lyle. Um, um, by the Tate Gallery and LBS about the connections of Tate and Lyle and Henry Tate and the Tate Gallery to slavery. So there's a link there if you want to follow that. Okay. I put in links to the maps um, on the LBS database as well, because one issue about the LBS database is I think people go to the main search page and then they think, well, what do I do now? Mm. What, um, how do I decide what to search for? Mm -hmm. If you go to the maps, it's a really good way to browse around the database. Also, in terms of how to approach the database, 
um, how to find something interesting and useful in it. If you go to the bottom of the main website page, um, there's a section called um, People of Interest, and there we've highlighted some examples of um, slave owners and enslaved people um, that we have more information about. So um, go to the People of Interest at the bottom of the main LBS website if you don't know who you're looking for. Johnny, good. All right, so I think at this point, let us take a couple more questions, just in case. As I said before, there's a whole bunch of questions in this chat box, we can't answer all of them. Um, so I think next time we do it, it might actually give it more time, like maybe three hours altogether, or four hours or something like that, or have it in two sections, because there's a, a, massive, <laughs> a massive number of comments, we can't deal with all of them. But, as I said before, we do this sort of event all year long. And all you have to do is check out our website, blackhistorywatch.co.uk, or even just um, check out the Eventbrite link you use to, um, to book this event. And you should find the connection to other events coming up because there's about 16, 160 events happening right now between, well, between now and the end of, of July. There's, a, there's lots of them all year long. As far as the chat's concerned, what we're going to do, I think, oh, I tell you what, we're going to leave the chat open for another 10 minutes or so. We'll play some music and you can chat to each other for 10 minutes and then we're going to switch it off because people, of course, have to go and eat their food and put their kids to bed and all the rest of it. So thank you to Rachel for all of your research. Actually, Rachel, how long have you been working at LBS? You're muted, I think, at the moment. 11 years. 11 years, okay. <laughs> and actually, that's a good point, though, because in those 11 years, um, what's the most amazing, surprising, interesting thing you've discovered from your research in 11 years? The biggest, uh, the change in the profile and the public understanding of the legacies of slavery, I think, has is, is just been extraordinary. I don't mean about people who are particularly interested and, and, and will join an event like um, all the audience here today. I mean, people who um, would think this has nothing to do with us. Mm. So the way that has changed in general public opinion, there's been a lot of pushback from that. But that change is still happening and it's it's carrying on. It's it's still going on. Okay. Um, in terms of my favorite people in the database, there are so many of extraordinary stories. And the best thing about it has been the connections with people who are tracing their own family history, because the the people we know most about in the LBS database, it's because people have sent us their information. So it's self-taught historians tracing their own families and coming up with um, wonderful details and then us benefiting from that. Brilliant. And also thank you for staying on because you know we weren't supposed to go until quarter to nine, but that's how it's gone. So thank you very much for that, Rachel. And we'll be doing stuff in the near future. Um, but for now, yeah, you can switch off your mic and camera. We're going to play some music. We'll leave the chat open for another 10 minutes or so. You can chat to each other. And then we're going to switch off in about 10 minutes time.
Thank you. 
Thank you.